Hey everyone, Charlie Murphy here, and today we're talking about Half-Life. Not the video game Half-Life, but the radioactive concept Half-Life. So in the last video we talked about radioactivity, which was when atoms are unstable and want to release excess energy to become stable. They do this by releasing radiation. We also talked about how much radioactive material we have, which is called activity. Because activity is measured as decays per second, we can logically deduce that any given sample of radioactive material will not stay radioactive forever. So just how long does it take for a sample to disappear? We're talking about half-life in this episode of the Atomic Age. So today we're going to talk about what is half-life, how long until radioactivity is gone, and then what does half-life tell us about a radioactive material? What are the implications? So as I've stated before, if we have a sample of radioactive material that's always decaying away, logically it won't stay radioactive forever. So how long does it take to decay away? That depends entirely on the radioactive material in question and what we call its half-life. So let's say we have a, an atom of some material here. This will be simplified, of course. Let's start with the technical definition of half-life. So half-life is the length of time in which one radioactive atom has a 50% chance of decaying. So if you extrapolate this out, this means that half of the radioactive material will decay away after one half-life. Well, how do you get to that from having a 50% chance of decaying? Like with flipping a coin, you don't always get heads or tails each successive turn. You sometimes get more heads than tails. So let's look at some coin flipping examples to try and explain this. This is my attempt to draw a penny here. So say if we flip this coin 10 times, what are the odds that we'll get five heads and five tails each time? Not likely, right? We'll probably get four heads and six tails or seven heads and three tails. How can we say that an atom has a 50% chance of decaying away during one half-life? that that means that there's always going to be half of a material left after one half-life. We can say that because let's increase the sample size. Say we got, let's say we do it 100 times. Probably be more like 55 heads and 45 tails, or 48 heads and 52 tails. If we bring it up to 1,000, it'll probably be even closer. 505 heads, 495 tails, etc. You know, popped us up to 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million, a billion. This is going to start getting very close to being 50-50 the, the higher you get this number. And this is what's called the law of big numbers. Uh, as you increase the sample of a probabilistic event, like flipping a coin or radioactive decay, the outcome approaches the probability of the, of the flip. So in our case, for radioactive decay, the flip is decay or remain. So as you get to really huge numbers, it really averages out to always being 50% goes away after a half-life. You know, it will be a little different in terms of a few number of atoms, but for our purposes, that's in indistinguishable. So effectively, you're always talking about 50% decaying away after one half-life. I just thought it would be good to let you know about that statistical discrepancy there. Because if someone ever asks you if it's exactly, no, it's not going to be exactly, but for all intents and purposes, it is 50%. All right, so now that we know what a half-life is, basically the time it takes for half of a radioactive material to decay away, so how many half-lives then will it take for all of the material to decay away? So let's, let's take a, an example here. Say we start with 10 curies of a radioactive material. After one half-life, we go to five curies here. So what happens if we do two half-lives? I'd be willing to guess some of you will probably say we'll go to zero curies, right? That is not correct. So remember what half-life is, what we defined half-life as. It, it's kind of confusing because it says half, half-lives, so you would think two halves make a whole, right? That's not the case here. Remember our definition. Half-life is the time it takes for half of a sample to decay away. After one half-life, this becomes our starting material. So now we go from five curies after one more half-life to two and a half curies. So as you can see, we have an exponential, exponentially decreasing value here. 
we'll go to, I'll just write it here. We'll go to 1.25 carries, and then we'll go to 0 0.6125 carries, etc., etc., all the way down. But as you can see, it takes a long time for this material to actually go away because it, the rate of decrease slows down over time. So after probably about seven half-lives is kind of when we effectively say a material is all gone. How many have we done here? One, two, three, four. So after seven half-lives, we'd have 0 0.078 curies left in this example, which is less than 1% of our starting material. So at, at this point, you could kind of effectively say that all the radioactive material is gone. It's not really all gone, but most of it is. So it this is we're, so we're talking about a long time here. So if we originally thought it was going to take two half-lives and our half-life was 10 seconds, you'd think after 20 seconds it would all be gone, but no. To get to less than 1%, we're talking about 70 seconds. So this takes a long time. So if you have some kind of dangerous radioactive material that has a half-life of 100 years, you're talking about 700 years before it gets below 1%. It'll still even be detectable at that point. So that's why these areas like Chernobyl and Fukushima are going to be dangerous for so long is because of how long that, what the effect of half-life is. Talking about at least seven half-lives for a lot of these materials to really get to like, quote unquote, the effectively gone state. Before we move on, I'd like to briefly discuss what you get after a radioactive material decays. Here's a radioactive sample A. Now, just because A has decayed away does not necessarily mean it has become a stable atom. It likely decayed away into radioactive sample B, so it likely just decayed into something else radioactive. So just because one radioactive sample decays away does not mean it has become something stable. It may become another radioactive material that has a completely different half-life than the one we just did. So say A, not, A had a half-life of 10 seconds, and maybe this next radioactive material has a half-life of 1,000 years. So it just became something completely different through radioactive decay with a completely different half-life. So this is also something you have to take into account when considering how long it will take for radioactive material to decay away. You have to consider what it's going to decay into. It's one thing to say how long is it going to take for this to, to decay away, but it's another thing to say how long will it take for all radioactivity to disappear, and that can be much, much longer. That's just a brief aside. We'll get more into that later. Something to keep in mind when discussing decay, though. So what does half-life tell us? So half-lives can vary widely among radionuclides. Take praseodymium, I know it's a mouthful, 155. Uh, shorthand for half-life is T1 half, and I'll be using that just to make it uh, a little easier to write here. Um, the one half may be over here. It doesn't matter. T one half. It is not lambda, like the half life series would have you believe. This is a decay constant, which is one over T one half. But the half life of praseodymium one fifty five is three hundred nanoseconds. That is three hundred billionths of a second, and that's the time it takes for light to go just 90 meters. <laughs> so very short amount of time. Another isotope we can look at here is thorium-232. And its half-life is 14 billion years, which is older than the age of the known universe. So half-lives can vary to ex extraneous extremes, these ridiculously in incomprehensible numbers. So what happens during half-lives, right? So half of a material is decaying away. And what is a decay? It's a release of energy. So per second, the praseodymium-155 is releasing much more energy than the thorium-232. So shorter half-lives, in general, all else equal, are the more dangerous ones. And that is precisely because they're releasing much more energy per second. And this is very important. This is why the time immediately after a nuclear meltdown or an atomic bomb is the most dangerous time is because you have all these short-lived radionuclides that are giving off tremendous amounts of energy per second. And then once those all decay away, you'll have these slower ones like thorium-232 that aren't as bad.
All right, let's do a little recap here. So half-life is the time it takes for half of a radioactive sample to decay away. This means that it takes seven half-lives to get to less than 1% of the initial material left over after radioactive decays because half-life, quote-unquote, resets after each half-life. So you go from 10 curies to 5 curies to 2.5 curies, etc. Also, decay does not necessarily equal stability. One radioactive material may have just decayed into another one. And finally, half-life is really important for telling us which radionuclides are more dangerous because a shorter half-life directly corresponds to the fact that a radioactive material is emitting more energy per second, so emitting more radiation per second. All else equal. So thank you guys so much for watching this video about half-life. In the next one, we'll get more into radiation. So what is radiation and the types of radioactive particles? And then after that, we can start getting into more advanced concepts. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. And be sure to subscribe to the Atomic Age for more nuclear content coming soon.